Hey everybody, welcome to Reading with Mrs. H, the Halloween edition. We are going to read Took by Mary Downing Hahn. This was um, requested by a listener slash, slash watcher, but I am so sorry. I was looking through the comments and I could not find who it was. Um, so whoever you are, if you see this, please remind me it was you and I will... Um, give you a shout out and thank you for recommending this book it is our uh, gonna be our Halloween series again that's took by Mary Downing Hahn we've read a couple of her other ones so I was excited to see another one all right oh and this one some chapters have titles and some have numbers so um, it, it kind of makes sense the way they do it but you'll, you'll see. Okay. The beginning. <clears throat> the old woman stands on the hilltop, just on the edge of the woods, well hidden from the farmhouse below. Two men and a woman are getting out of a car that has a sign for Jack Lingo Realty painted on the side. The old woman has seen plenty of realtors in her time. <clears throat> she doesn't know this one, but she remembers his pa, old Jack Lingo, and his pa, Edward, and the one afore him, back and back, through the years, to the first Lingo ever to settle in this valley and take up the buying and selling of houses. Though young Lingo doesn't know it, Auntie is helping him sell that house to the man and the woman in the only way she knows. Muttering and humming and moving her hands this way and that way, weaving spells in the air sending messages as she's always done messages that make folks need things not worth needing dangerous things things they regret getting you might wonder why auntie wants this man and woman to buy the house truth to tell she doesn't give a hoot about them they're ignorant fools but they have something she wants and something she aims to get. It's almost time for a change, and they've come on schedule, just as she'd known they would. New for old, she chants to herself, strong for weak, healthy for sickly, pretty for ugly. When the man and the woman follow young Lingo into the old Estes house, Auntie sways back and forth, grinning and rubbing her dry, bony hands together. Her skirt blows in the wind, and long strands of white hair whip around her face. With a little hop and a jig, she turns to something hidden in the trees behind her. Won't be long now, my boy. We'll get rid of the old pet and get us a new one to raise up. Though he stays out of sight, her companion makes a noise like a hog when it's hungry. A squealing sort of snort that might be a laugh, or it might be something else altogether. Auntie gazes down at the run-down farmhouse and outbuildings, the overgrown fields, the woods creeping closer year by year. From the hill, she can see the missing shingles of the roof, the warped boards riddled with termites and dry rot, the cracks in the chimney. Almost 50 years have passed since the Estes farm, Estes family left the place. Nobody has lived there since then. Local folk avoid the place. They scare their children with stories about the girl, the one before her, and the one before her, back and back to the very first girl. Fear keeps them out of the woods and away from the cabin on Brewster's Hill. Those children know all about Auntie and her companion. But newcomers always show up, city people who've never heard the stories. If the valley folk try to warn them, they scoff and laugh and call the story superstitious nonsense. They come from places where lights burn all night. They don't heed the dark and what it hides there. It all works to Auntie's advantage. Down below, a door opens and Auntie watches young Lingo Lead the man and woman outside. Even though they speak softly, Auntie hears every word. 
They aim to buy that tumble-down wreck of a house, fix it up, and live there with their children. A boy and a girl, they tell him. It's just what they want. A chance to get away from their old life and start anew in the country. They'll get some chickens, they say, a couple of goats, maybe even a cow or sheep. They'll plant a garden, grow their own food. The man and the woman get into the realtor's car, laughing, excited. Auntie spits into the dirt. Fools, they'll find out soon enough. She listens to the car's engine until she can't hear it anymore. Then she snaps her fingers and does another jig. It's falling into place just like I predicted, dear boy. But don't you say a word to her back at the cottage. She ain't to know till it happens. Her companion snorts and squeals, and the two of them disappear to the dark woods to wait. Chapter 1 <clears throat> It was a long drive from Fairfield, Connecticut to Woodville, West Virginia, two days, with an overnight stay in Maryland. My sister Erica and I were sick of the back seat, sick of each other, and mad at our parents for making us leave our home, our school, and our friends. Had they asked us how we felt about moving? Of course not. They've never been the kind of parents who ask you if you want to drink your milk from the red glass or the blue glass. They just hand you a glass, and that's that. Milk tastes the same whether it's glass, the glass is blue, or red, or purple. Going to West Virginia was a big thing, something we should have, have had a say in, but no. They left us with a neighbor, drove down there, found a house they liked, and bought it, just like that. They were the grown-ups. The adults, the parents, they were in charge. They made the decisions. In all fairness, they had a reason for what they did. Dad worked for a big corporation. He earned a big salary. We had a big house, two cars, and all sorts of other big stuff. Expensive stuff. Erica and I went to private school. Mom didn't work. She was what's called a soccer mom. Driving me and Erica and our friends to games and clubs and the country club pool. She and Dad played golf. They were planning to buy a sailboat. But then the recession came along and the big corporation started laying people off. Dad was one of them. He thought he'd find another job fast, but he didn't. A year went by. One of our big cars was repossessed. Erica and I went to public school. We gave up the country club. There was no more talk about sailboats. The bank started sending letters. Credit card companies called. Dad and Mom were maxed out financially. The mortgage company threatened foreclosure. <sighs> Don't worry. This is just root beer. <laughs> I know it looks like a grown-up drink, but it is not. It is just root beer. <clears throat> so we had to sell the house. I can understand that. But why did they have to move to West Virginia? It was cheaper to live there, Dad said. Eric and I would love it. So much space, woods and fields and mountains. He took to singing, singing Country Roads, an old John Denver song about West Virginia, putting lots of emphasis on almost heaven, West Virginia. He, almost, he also informed us that the license plate said, Wild Wonderful. So here we are. Here we were on an interstate with nothing to see but mountains and woods. Wild, but not wonderful, in my opinion. It was like being in a foreign country. How would I ever get used to the nature surrounding us? Beside me, Erica was talking to the doll Mom had given her. Not because it was her birthday or anything, but because she was so unhappy about leaving Fairfield. That's rewarding bad behavior, if you ask me. I was just as unhappy as my sister, but since I didn't cry myself to sleep and mope in my room and refuse to eat, 
All I got was a pair of binoculars and Peterson's Field Guide to Birds of North America. Dad thought I might like to identify the birds we were sure to see when we went hiking. Well, maybe I would. But still, the doll was ten times more expensive than my binoculars. It came with a little trunk full of clothes. There were even outfits in my sister's size so she and the doll could dress alike. And it had its own bed, too. And its hair was red just like Erica's and cut the same way. All the time we were in the van, Erica talked to the doll. She tried all its clothes on and told the doll how pretty it was. She hugged it and kissed it. She even named it Little Erica. It was making me sick. But every time I complained, Erica got mad and we started quarreling and Mom turned around and blamed it all on me. Leave your sister alone, Daniel, she'd say. She's perfectly happy playing with Little Erica. Read a book or something. You know I can't read in the car. Do you want me to barf all over that stupid doll? At last, we turned off the interstate. The roads narrowed and ran up dark hills, crossed fields, passed farms, and tunneled through the woods. We glimpsed mountain and s mountains and swift rivers. The towns were farther apart and smaller, some no more than a strip of houses and shops along the road. By the time Dad finally pulled off an unpaved road and headed down pulled pulled off an unpaved road and headed down a narrow driveway, the woods around us were dark. In the van's headlights, the trees looked like a stage set lit by, lit by spotlights. The van bounced over ruts and bumps, tossing Erica and me toward and away from each other. Stay on your side, Daniel, Erica said, and stop banging into me and little Erica. We don't like it. That doll doesn't care. She's not real. She is so. Be quiet, Daniel, Mom said. It's not my fault, I said. Instead of blaming me, tell Dad to slow down. Just then, we came out of the woods, and I got my first view of the house. It stood in the middle of a field of tall grass, weeds actually. Even in the dark, I could see that the place was a wreck. The porch sagged, sagged under the weight of vines growing up the walls and across the roof. Tall, shaggy bushes blocked most of the windows on the first floor. Shutters hung crooked. Some were missing altogether. I was sure it hadn't been painted for a long time. Erica was the first to speak. It's scary. What's scary about it? Dad asked. It's dark. She hugged her doll tightly. The woods are scary too. And there aren't any other houses. Wait until morning, Erica, Mom said. It's lovely in the daylight. You'll see. And we have a few neighbors down the road, Dad added. How far down the road, I wondered. And what were they like? Dad and Mom got out of the van and headed toward the house. Erica ran to catch up and slipped her hand into Mom's. I followed them, breathing in the unfamiliar smells of the woods and listening to night sounds. Wind rattled branches and hissed through the weeds in the field. A shutter banged against the side of the house. An owl called from the woods. At the same moment, something made the hair on the, my neck rise. Sure that someone was watching us, I turned around and stared down the dark driveway. I saw no one, but I shivered. And not because I was cold. This title is chaptered... Uh, uh, this chapter is titled Arrival. <laughs> The old woman stands on the hilltop, at the edge of the woods, well hidden from the farmhouse below, just as she did before. But now it's a dark, cold night, lit by the moon. All around her, bushes and branches rattle in a wind that carries autumn's breath. But she isn't cold. She leans on her staff and peers toward the road. They're coming, she calls to her companion. He snorts and continues snuffling about in the dead leaves for good things to eat. Head, uh, headlights bounce down the driveway. A big car stops by the house. 
even in the dark, a person can see that it's a ramshackle wreck of a place, ready to topple with the first strong wind that comes its way. The car door... Car doors open, and the interior lights come on. She sees the girl, just the one she needs. The child gets out, clutching a dolly. The old woman sniffs fear. The girl is scared of the dark and the old house. She doesn't want to live here. Well, she won't live here long, will she? The girl's name is blown by the wind across the dark field and lay at the woman's feet. Erica. Er Rick. She likes to draw the name out, especially the last syllable. Erica. Erica. The woman whispers. The name glides lightly through the air, a rustle of black silk thread, and the, winds itself into the girl's ear. She sees the girl tense and look around, move closer to her mother. Yes, the old woman hisses. You'll do, Erica. Erica. She does one of her little jigs and calls her companion. Time to go, dear boy. We'll see her soon. Don't you worry. She's the one. She's ours. As the family enters their new home, the old woman and her companion wrap themselves in darkness and make their way home. Chapter 2 While we waited on the porch... Dad fished a big old-fashioned key out of his pocket. With a lot of effort, he finally got it to turn in the lock. Moonlight followed us inside and cast our shadows across the dusty floor. In front of us, stairs led to the second story. Mom flicked a switch, and the shadows fled. To the right was the living room, or maybe the parlor, empty now except for a fireplace. Three tall windows with old-fashioned wavy glass reflected on, reflected us standing in the hall, slightly distorted, like people in a funhouse. Where's our furniture? Erica asked. It's coming tomorrow, Mom told her. But where are we sleeping? She asked, sounding a bit f tearful. Don't you remember? Dad asked. We brought our camping stuff. Sleeping bags, foam mats, pillows, blankets. Can I sleep with Mommy? Of course you can. Mom put her arm around Erica and hugged her. I was getting pretty tired of Erica's clinging behavior. What's wrong with you? I whispered. You never used to act like this. I never had to live in the woods before, she turned to Mom. Are we going to eat wild berries? Of course not, sweetie, Dad said. Whatever gave you that idea? That's what happens sometimes in stories. Well, this isn't a story, Erica, Mom said. Dad got an ancient gas stove going, and Mom heated a pot of water. When it boiled, she dumped in noodles and heated a jar of marinara sauce. We ate our first meal in the house, picnic style, in front of the fire. That actually sounds kind of nice. Um, Erica snuggled beside Mom and shared her food with little Erica. The food stuck to the doll's face, and Erica tenderly wiped her clean with a napkin. Later, we all crawled into our sleeping bags and watched what was left of the fire fall into ash. The lights were out, and the moon shone in through the tall windows. I heard Erica whispering to the doll. Sometime during the night, I woke up. I'd drunk too much soda at dinner, and now I needed a, the bathroom. I eased out of my sleeping bag and got up to my feet. Dad snored. Mom slept like a dead woman, and Erica murmured as if she were dreaming. I tiptoed across the floor and eased the front door open. It was easier to pee outside than find my way upstairs to the bathroom. The moonlight was brilliant, and the stars were clustered thickly over my head, more than I'd ever seen in Fairfield. After I finished what I came out to do, I stood on the porch and gazed at the dark mass of woods bordering the fields. The night was cold, but as I turned to go inside, I was stopped by a sound in the darkness. A howl, which m might have been the wind in the trees, but was scarier. Much scarier. I shivered and edged toward the door, but before I stepped inside, I looked back. Something moved at the edge of the woods. Its head gleamed in the moonlight. 
as white as bone. I heard the howl again, louder this time, and stumbled backward, slamming and bolting the door. Daniel, Mom called sleepily. What are you doing up in the middle of the night? I went outside to pee. Something in the woods howled. I slid into my sleeping bag, shivered with cold and fear. Shh, she whispered. You'll wake up Dad and Erica. Didn't you hear it? She shook her head. It was probably an owl or a fox. No, I saw it, I told her. It was as tall as a man, and its head shone in the moonlight. Mom smoothed my hair. Go back to sleep, Daniel. There's nothing out there. It's dark. You're in a strange place, and your eyes were playing tricks on you. I moved a little closer to her. Maybe she was right. She must be right. Monsters didn't roam in the woods anywhere but in fairy tales. I closed my eyes and practiced breathing slowly and deeply, but it was almost daylight by the time I fell asleep. When I woke up, sunlight filled the living room. Just as Mom had said, whatever I'd heard and seen in the dark had a natural explanation. Night noises, most likely. Animals going about their nocturnal business, embellished with my imagination. Moonlight and shadows play tricks on you. The moving truck arrived before we'd finished breakfast, and Mom put us all to work. We picked our bedrooms first. Mine overlooked the woods, which were not quite as close to the house as I thought the night before, but close enough for me to see a deer pause at the edge of the trees and then vanish into the shadows. The lawns in Connecticut were overrun with deer, but this was a wild deer and therefore more noble than the ones who ate our shrubbery and our flowers and the vegetables Mom tried to grow. Erica's room was across the hall from mine. At the front of the house, Mom and Dad were next to her. The bedroom beside mine was reserved for Dad. His office, he called it. At the end of the hall was a small room, probably a sewing room, Mom said, or a nursery. She claimed it for her weaving. The loom will fit just right under the window, she said. The moving men spent most days, most of the day tramping around the house, upstairs and down, putting furniture where Mom told them to. When they finally drove away, Mom gave us our tasks. Unpack our clothes and belongings and put them away. I finished first and stopped in Erica's room to see how she was doing. Her clothes lay in a heap on her unmade bed. Her boxes of toys and books sat in the middle of the floor where the moving men had left them still taped shut. Erica sat on a window seat, her back to me. She held little Erica. We don't like it here, Erica whispered to the doll. It's a bad, scary place, no matter what they say. You and I know, but nobody believes us. Little Erica had nothing to say that I could hear, but my sister bent her head close to the doll as if she were listening to her. Yes, she murmured, yes. I hated to interrupt the weird conversation, but I stepped into the room and said, Mom told you to put your stuff away, but you haven't even started. Erica whirled around. Her red hair swung like a flag, and so did the dolls. I'm never going to put anything away until we go home. This is home now. I picked up a box labeled socks and underwear and pried off the tape. I'll help you. Leave my things alone. Erica laid the doll down and snatched the box away. Get out of my room, Daniel. We don't want you here. What's going on? Mom stood in the doorway. I was just trying to unhelp her, help her unpack. I don't want him to help, Erica said. I'm leaving everything just like this until we go home. Honey, we are home. Mom tried to hug her, but she pulled away. Home is Connecticut, Erica whispered. <laughs> that was the fireplace, if you heard that. <clears throat> Home is Connecticut, Erica whispered. Not here. Mom made a gesture toward the door. Leave this to me, Daniel. As I left the room, Mom shut the door. I lingered in the hall for a moment. Mom was talking softly. Erica was crying. I found Dad in the basement in front of a huge furnace that looked like something you'd find on the n Nautilus? 
all dials and levers and doors and pipes. A submarine engine only Captain Nemo understood. Steampunk in every way. Let me see, Dad mused. It's September. Hope hopefully I'll have time to figure out how this monster works before we need it. I pictured a long, cold winter with the four of us huddled around the fireplace to keep warm. Or maybe I can call somebody from the oil company, Dad went on, and he can explain it to me. <clears throat> we stood side by side and looked around the basement. It was dark and dank and musty. The ceiling was so low, Dad could barely stand up straight. Pipes festooned with cobwebs hung even lower. The only light was a bare bulb hanging by a cord from a crossbeam. The floor was dirt, the walls stone. The damp air smelled as if it had been trapped down here since the house was built. Once I establish myself as a photographer, Dad said, we'll fix this basement up. Replace the furnace with something new that I can understand. Put in some windows, maybe a sliding glass door. I could even build a dark room and get out my old film cameras. While Dad was picturing a dark room and sliding glass doors, I was imagine, imagining a murderer carrying his victims down the steep, rickety steps and digging graves in the dirt floor. I'm going outside, I told Dad. I could use some fresh air. Leaving him poking around in the junk piled in every corner, I found Mom at the kitchen table, busy sorting napkins and tablecloths. Erica was sitting near her, reading Bedtime for Francis to little Erica. Oh, I loved that book as a kid. I vaguely remember it. Bedtime for Francis. I remember what the cover looks like. Uh, neither of them noticed me, so I slipped out the back door to do some exploring. The house looked even worse in daylight. Peeling paint exposed bare gray wood. A gutter, gutter dangled from the eaves. And a downspout lay in the weeds. Judging by the number of shingles I saw on the ground, the roof probably leaked. The porch floorboards were warped. The railing was loose, and the steps tilted to one side. Behind the house, I discovered a small, tumble-down barn almost hidden under a tangle of wild grapevines, honeysuckle, poison ivy, and brambles. All around it grew a jungle of pokeberry weeds taller than I was. Poisonous berries hung from the red stalks in black clusters, like grapes. Sticking up from the weeds were two doorless refrigerators and an old plow and an ancient Ford pickup truck, several rusted air conditioners and a mildew sofa. The town dump, I thought, right in our own backyard. What were Dad and Mom thinking when they bought this place? Had they lost their minds? We'd never get out of the get the house fixed up, let alone clear the junk out. I felt like packing my belongings and siding with Erica. Maybe between the two of us, we could persuade Mom and Dad to go back to Connecticut. All right, and we're at 28 minutes, so we're going to close there for this video. Yeah, we're <laughs> since I got a late start to the Halloween special, I'm sure we'll go past Halloween, but that's okay. We're at least encompassing it. I'm wearing a festive jack-o'-lantern t-shirt that's hiding behind my microphone. I'm so in the spirit. <laughs> um, today, when I'm recording this, is the 29th. Um, in my town, in here in Illinois, we have um, trick-or-treating actually falls on Halloween. So we'll be doing that in a couple days. And if the forecast is correct, we will be doing that in the snow. Yay. <laughs> um, if you celebrate Halloween, um, do you trick or treat? Did you already do it? Some did it this past weekend. Uh, maybe you have it coming up here like we do in the cold. Um, feel free to comment and, and tell me and uh, our other fellow uh, readers about it. We would love to hear your your thoughts and your stories. So, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, until next time, keep reading.